our story is coming from the scriptures, God's sacred love letters to humanity. And God's word has a theme that runs through it like a thread. I like to sum it up this way. It is the love of God as revealed in the person of Jesus Christ and ultimately him crucified. And we're going to see that that is going to be our theme as we go from night to night. As a reminder, we're going to be here paralleled with VBS until next week, Wednesday. So you're invited to come again from night to night and bring a friend. God's love letters was our message last night. And again, as I was saying earlier, that it was a little bit on the heady side. We talked a lot about archaeology. We talked a lot about prophecy. We talked about the scriptures being that which brings us to Jesus, that which reveals what God is like. But tonight we're going to move into something a little bit more engaging. You see, the Bible is where the story is taken from that we're going to be covering from night to night. And we're going to start at the beginning of the story. There are a lot of stories in our society today that make up books, they make up movies, they even make up songs. And there's a lot of famous beginnings to stories. You may be familiar with some of these beginnings to stories. Here are some famous story beginnings. This one is from Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities. Once upon a time. Are you familiar with that beginning to a story? Once upon a time. Here's another one. It was the best of times and it was the worst of times. That's by Ann Taylor, back when we were grown-ups. Here's another one. It was a dark and stormy night. Written by Paul Crawford. But our story begins this way. Four powerful words that are loaded with meaning. Our story begins in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. And it begins this way. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. Now, you can look at that and say, well, wait a minute, CJ, that is not the full sentence. And that's okay, we're going to get there. But we have to pause right here. Because God, at the very beginning of the story, is declaring something about himself. First of all, he's telling us there was a beginning. Everything that we see around us is not by chance. It had a beginning, and it had an initiator, and he describes himself as God. But who is this God? Who is this God that the Bible, in the beginning of our journey, the beginning of our story, how does he describe himself? And I want to ask you tonight, what has been your picture of God. Maybe growing up you had a picture of God as an angry judge. You had a picture of God as someone that was waiting for you to mess up so that he could strike you down, that you would hear someone say if you're acting up that a lightning bolt's about to strike you dead, amen? Did you have a picture of God as an angry judge? Was he an absent father to you? Now I've got to confess just being a little transparent, a little bit of my story is that my parents uh, raised in a Christian home, but my parents unfortunately got divorced when I was about 13 years of age. But prior to that, there was a six-year period of time in my life where my father was not a regular present figure in my life. And I had to make a decision. As much as my father loved me, and he still does today, we have a great relationship. But I had to say to myself, is that going to paint my picture of God? At some point, I had to make a personal decision for myself as to what kind of picture God would be for me. Some people have not had a good father figure in their lives. And so therefore, that later on, as they engage in spiritual or religious experience, colored their picture of God. What does God look like to you? Is he an absent father? Some people see God as a control freak. I don't like to use that term in church, but some people see God this way. He's in control, we say, and yes, Scripture describes him as being in control, but we get this image of someone that is just arbitrarily doing things in our lives, regardless of how we think or feel. Is God a control freak? What is your picture of God? Think about that question as we continue on. 
But what we want to understand is not what some religions in the world paint God as. And quite honestly, as a Christian community, Christianity in general has not always done historically a very good job of painting a good picture of God. What we want to know, as we talked about last night, God's sacred love letters, his word to us, we found out that it is reliable. What we want to know is what does the Bible describe God as? How does the Bible describe God? What is he like according to the Bible? The Bible emphatically declares the Apostle John in 1 John 4, 8, describes God as love. Now, I know a lot of people hear that, and it just goes right over their heads. But there is a lot of meaning loaded in those simple three words in 1 John 4, 8. God is love. It doesn't say that God has love. It doesn't say that God loves it says that God is in himself love. He is the very essence of what love is. As you can see, obviously, that inspires our theme for this entire series, the divine love story, because this paints how you read the rest of the story. If you have this picture of God, then that's going to influence how you read the remainder of the book from Genesis to Revelation. You're going to look for that in every one of the 66 books. We talked about that. The Bible is made up of 66 books. You're going to look for that in every one of the 66 books found in God's love letters to you, the Bible. Is the God that you see in Scripture described, or is he actually seen? Do you see him like this? God is love. The Bible goes on to describe what our God is like in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and number 4. This is a very important declaration, if you will. They call it the Shema. The Jews repeat this often. They say, hear, O Israel, the Lord, that right there, Lord, in the original there is Yahweh or Jehovah or Adonai. The Lord, our God, the Lord is, what does it say? One. The Lord is one. There is not many gods. There is only one God. The Bible emphatically declares that. Even though throughout human history, people have tried to erect man-made gods that were made in the image of many of the uh, creation that God made, God says there is no other God. I am it. There is only one God. He describes himself in the singular. And uh, there's something else that describes itself in the singular. You find it in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. This is after the marriage of Adam and Eve. Now, I'm a very happily married gentleman. I've been married for over six years, so I, I really enjoy this scripture here. So excuse me if I get just a little excited. It says here, Therefore, a man shall leave, shall leave his mother and his father and mother and hold fast. I like that, hold fast. Some versions say cleave. You got to leave and cleave to your wife, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become, what does it say? One flesh. One flesh. And I want to tell you, that right there is not happenstance. That was something very intentional. We're going to talk a little bit more about this setting here in Genesis, the, the beginning of the story in creation, the first marriage. But the two, the two shall become one flesh, the Bible says. And we're going to find out a little bit later that God created male and female, man and woman, Adam and Eve, in his image. We're about to find out some additional information about his image. The two shall become one. They are two, but they are? I find right now that my wife and I are beginning to finish each other's sentences. We can look at each other and kind of know what the other one is thinking. We are two 
individuals, amen? We have likes, we have dislikes, we have a lot of similarities, and we have some differences, but we are one unit, one. Many times I'm talking to my friends on Facebook, and I'll say, oh, we love you, or I'll say, we miss you. Now, can I also say, I love you, and I miss you? Yes, I can. But can I also say, we miss you? We love you because the two are one flesh. God describes himself in the Genesis account of creation when he does the beautiful work of creating man. He says, uh, it says, then God said, let, what does it say? Let us. But wait a minute, it says, then God. But we just described God as one. But it says here, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let us create, make man in our image according to our likeness. We want man to reflect what we are like. We're going to discover that that is love. Image is also another term that is synonymous with character throughout Scripture as well. Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Well, the Bible goes on to describe this in further detail in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is also known as the gospel prophet. If you go through his writings in the book of Isaiah, he's always bringing up Jesus, the Messiah who is to come. Isaiah, the gospel prophet. In Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8, Isaiah is receiving a vision of God. And it says, then Isaiah speaking, then I heard the voice of the Lord, the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall, what does it say? Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, and this should be our response as well, here I am, send me, was Isaiah's response. But listen, wait a minute, it said, the Lord said, but then it says, who, will go f- who shall I send, and who will go for us? Here we go again, we see that God can describe himself as an I, but God can also describe himself as an us. God, when he is now in the form of Jesus Christ and he's about to ascend, he's speaking to his disciples and he gives us some additional information about this us that is in God. He gives one of the most beautiful scriptures in all of the New Testament, something I think every believer should take personally to heart. But it says right here, Jesus speaking, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in, listen, the name, in the name of the Father and of the, and of the Holy Spirit, in the name, singular, of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This us we're finding out is three. Paul, he is writing to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14. He describes even further detail here about this this triune pair within the Godhead. He says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Paul adding further detail to the us that is in God. Let the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. God is what we call in grammar a singular plurality. You may call it a a plural singularity or a singular plurality. Can I explain this in full detail, ladies and gentlemen? Can I explain this in full detail? No, I cannot. There is a level of mystery here. If I could fully explain this reality right here, I think I would be someone greater than myself. There is a level of mystery here. This is something that we cannot fully explain, but this is what the Bible testifies about our God, who John, 1 John 4, 8, describes as love. God is a singular. He can describe himself as one unit, as I, but he's also a Plurality, he describes himself in three distinct persons, co-eternal beings, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The three are one. 
There's God the Father. If you, ne if you never had a present father in your life, God says, I'll be your father. I will be your father. If your father wasn't there, God says, I will be a father to you. There's God the Son, that is Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, our Savior. And then there is God the Holy Spirit, our Comforter. If you need comfort in your life, Jesus promises you the promise of the Holy Spirit. I give you comfort, I give you peace. It comes through the Holy Spirit. We will talk in another meeting about the fruit of the Spirit. God is three. God is three in one. So our story begins this way. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. And God is already describing to us who he is, and that's going to influence how we read the rest of the story. But have you ever asked this question, for those of you that have been reading scripture for most of your life or at some, for some period of time in your life, have you ever wanted to know, because the Bible does say, in the beginning, God, have you ever wanted to know what was God doing? What was he, what was they, what were they doing in eternity past? That's a Bible expression for the time before the creation of the heavens and the earth. What was going on in eternity past? Well, again, there is a level of mystery here. But from what we understand about God, that God is one, but he is also three, we understand that God is within himself a relationship, that God is in himself a community. Love, by its very nature, is other-centered. And so what we understand, based on the Bible's description of who God is, we understand that what was going on before the creations of the heaven and the earth, it says, in the beginning, God. God was there before the creation of the heavens and the earth. Therefore, he was the one that created it all. He had to be before it all. And so we understand now, that now by the very definition of love that they were loving while simultaneously being loved. Now, that's a powerful statement. I want to give you a moment just to think about that for a second. They were loving while simultaneously being loved. This is beyond a feeling. This is beyond merely some emotion. They were loving while simultaneously being loved. The Father, who was he living for? He was living for the Son and the Holy Spirit. Who was the Son living for? The Son was living for the? And the? Holy Spirit. Who was the Holy Spirit living for? He was living for the Father. And he was living for the Son within each other, loving while simultaneously being loved. This is the nature of the Godhead. This is the nature of love. You see, love is like a tickle. Now, some of you are sitting here next to each other, and I don't know if you're bold enough to do this, but I want you to try something really quick. Would you do that with me? I want you to take your finger, I want you to raise it up, and I want you to take those two fingers, and I want you to put it right here, and I want you to just go right there in your rib. Now, that feels a little awkward, doesn't it? Yeah. Does that tickle? No, it doesn't, does it? But if you, and I see some of you sitting next to each other, if you were to take those same two fingers and place it on someone else's side and begin to do the exact same thing to them, what would take place? What would transpire? There would be some tickling going on, right? It would be a funny sensation, right? You see, by its very nature, tickling is something that cannot be experienced by yourself. Is that right? You see, tickling requires someone else, doesn't it? What about that place on your back that sometimes itches? And you try to get it, but you can't quite get it. It just doesn't really do it. So what do you do? You ask somebody to help you? Get that itch, don't you? Even itching, scratching, sometimes requires someone else to help you. Amen? And it's the same thing within the Godhead. It's the same thing in love in its very nature. Love requires someone else to give it to. It requires it starting with you and ending somewhere else. This was what the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit was experiencing from eternity past. We, we can only get a glimpse of this. We can only allow our minds to, to, to capture it the best way that we can. But I want to let you know that that experience of loving while simultaneously being loved became so intense that it could not be kept within the Godhead itself. 
Love, by definition, is other-centered, and therefore it must be shared. Have you ever had something that was really good? You ever cooked something that was so good that you said, I've got to share this with somebody else, and maybe somebody else is sitting next to you, and what did you do? You took it, right? And then you say, oh, you've got to try this. This is so good. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, taste and see, that the Lord is good. When you have something good, you want to share it with somebody else. When I got married, I wanted to share it with everybody. I wanted to post it wherever I could on Facebook. Married. <laughs> Love, by its very definition, is other-centered. It focuses completely on the other person. Therefore, selfishness is focused on me. I. It's the opposite of who God is. God cannot do anything but love. It has to be shared. Therefore, when God made us, he made us to have this exact same experience. God made us for love. We were made by love. God is love. And we were made for love. We were made to have this same experience, to love while simultaneously being loved. This experience, this principle, was to be experienced both vertically and horizontally. Love to God and love to each other. When God made Adam and Eve in the garden, they were loving God with their whole mind and their body and their soul 100% vertically. This love defines God's ideal for human relationships. God's ideal for human relationships and friendships, loving while simultaneously being loved. Marriage relationships, which is a different type of expression of love, but God has that same ideal for the marriage relationship, loving while simultaneously being loved in the church community. How many of us want to see that in our church community? Amen. The Bible says that you will know that, he is your, that you are his disciples by your love for one another, loving while simultaneously being loved. Communities our larger communities, our neighborhoods. How many of you want to see loving while simultaneously being loved in your communities? That was God's ideal for the communities of the world. The world, loving while simultaneously being loved. Had man not sinned, that would have defined this planet. Loving while simultaneously being loved. So this Reality of love, God is love, it shapes the whole divine love story, the story of redemption from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And we can, in a very simple way, break down the story of Genesis to Revelation, God's divine love story, into four phases, in a very simple way. There's creation, which we'll talk about tomorrow night. There is the fall there is rescue. I love talking about rescue, and I love talking about restoration. You could basically say that we go from creation to re-creation. This will be our journey until next week, Wednesday night. You don't want to miss one night. You don't want one of your friends to miss one night. It will truly be a blessing. As we see this unfold, see, last night we had to establish the book that we're going to consider. And now we're establishing the God of the book, the main subject of the book, and this is the phase of what we're going to be covering. This principle of love, God is love, loving while simultaneously being loved, the ideal that God had established from the beginning is his ideal, and this is what he wants to bring us back to in restoration. Since the fall, what has been God's passion? I want someone just to just share with me in one word. What has been God's passion since the fall? Love. Love. Okay. Anyone else? Redemption. Redemption. Anyone else have another word? Restoration. Restoration. These are all great. And you put those all together. They do make up God's passion. The Bible says, and we're not surprised by the first four words, are we? For God so loved the world just the Christian church? No. Just one group of people, one race? No. God loves the world. As a matter of fact, love is the only thing that God can do. God cannot love. It's just a part of his nature. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have e eternal life. 
This is God's passion. This is what God is desiring for the world. And he wants that to be our passion as well, amen? Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19, he continues to add definition to this passion of God. He says that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. Not counting men's sins against them. Are you glad that we serve a God who desires not to hold you accountable for the sins? He desires to forgive you and let you off the hook and give you strength not to continue making the same mistakes? Not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Someone just said God's passion was reconciliation. I agree with that 100%. The Bible says he has now committed to us the message of reconciliation. This is what I'm the most passionate about. This is what gets me up here to preach this message every single night. The message that he has committed to me of reconciliation. See, reconciliation is a relational term, isn't it? There was a breakup and now there needs to be a bringing back together. God desires to be brought back in full relationship with humanity, and he wants to do it through his son. They were so committed to reconciliation with mankind, as we just saw a minute ago in John 3, 16, God sent his only son to come to this planet to take the form of a human being. And at the very outset of his ministry, before he even begins to do a miracle, before Jesus raises anybody from the dead, before Jesus goes to the cross, this is what happens. It says here when he goes to be baptized and when Jesus was baptized immediately, he went up from the water. And by the way, when it says he came up from the water, Jesus was fully immersed. That's why in many Christian churches today, including this one, we baptize by immersion fully and we bring you right back up just as the way Jesus was baptized. He went up from the water and behold, the heavens were open to him and he saw the Spirit of God, that's another word for the Holy Spirit, descending in like, like a dove and coming to him and resting upon him. And behold, a voice, whose voice was that? The voice of God the Father. A voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son. Could there be any more endearing words from a father? This is my beloved son whom I am well pleased. Did Jesus do a miracle yet? Jesus had not healed one person yet. And the father is saying to him, he's affirming him, he's saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I want to suggest to you that in Christ, when you get baptized, when you commit your life to Jesus Christ, when you recommit your life to Jesus Christ, the father is looking at you before you do any good works. He is looking at you and he's saying, you are my beloved Son, you are my beloved daughter in whom I'm well pleased. You see, it's in that reality that those good things that we do are produced. It's in the reality that we are his beloved son and daughter in whom he is well pleased because of what Jesus Christ did for us. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all three present at the baptism of Jesus Christ as he is now about to begin his earthly ministry. But Jesus, as he is now ending his ministry, as he is now ending a period of three and a half years of demonstrating what we've been talking about, loving while simultaneously being loved, being loved by his Father, being loved, no doubt, by his followers, the disciples, demonstrating the love of the Father to humanity. Jesus now says, guess what? I may be leaving, but I'm not leaving you alone. He says, when the counselor, another word for the Holy Spirit, comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about, about, about me. Jesus says, I want you to pay close attention. This is very important tonight. Jesus says, the Father will send the Holy Spirit. Amen? The Holy Spirit will testify about me, Jesus says. And then Jesus says elsewhere that he reveals the Father, that he is the only way to the Father. 
So I want you to catch what's happening here, how they're working together for your salvation and for my redemption. Jesus says that the Father sends the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Counselor. Jesus now is the only way to the Father. The Father sends the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is bringing you to Jesus. Jesus is bringing you to the Father, all three working together for your redemption. Every day, in all of your struggles, whatever you're going through, the Holy Spirit's main purpose is to so fill you with the presence of the Lord so as to bring you and draw you to Jesus, to point you to Jesus. He says, the spirit of truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me, Jesus says. The Holy Spirit is bringing you to the truth. That means he's bringing you to Jesus. All truth points you to Jesus. The Holy Spirit is bringing you to Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way to the Father. I want to describe to you briefly as we begin to wrap this up tonight the type of relationship that God wants to have with you goes beyond a master and servant relationship. He does use that terminology in Scripture, but elsewhere in Scripture, he uses very intimate language. Sometimes it will make you blush some of the things that God has to say about you in Scripture. And I want to read to you how God feels about you, how this God who is love feels about you. He says, I passed by again. I saw that the time had come for you to fall in love. I covered your naked body with my coat and promised to love you. Yes, I made a marriage covenant with you, and you became mine. This is what the sovereign Lord says. This is God speaking to the children of Israel. And he uses poetic language, describing them as initially, if you read on in this chapter and the next chapter in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 16 and 17, and there's a really good song called Ezekiel 17, or Ezekiel, and it's by the band Gunger. It's a really great song that really paints an excellent picture of what God is saying right here. But this is also prophetically speaking to prophetic Israel the followers of Jesus Christ throughout time. God is saying here that I don't want you merely to be my servant. I want you to be my bride. God speaks to you in Scripture as his bride, that he is betrothing to himself. The Bible goes on to say in the book of Hosea, again, the prophet Hosea called to marry a prostitute of all things because God was trying to demonstrate, to show to Israel that they were they were not being faithful to their relationship, to their covenant with God. But God uses this description, again, of what he desires, what he wants to experience with us. He says, in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. Are you seeing what God is communicating here tonight? Are you seeing the desire that God has to not just have you as a mere servant? God wants you to be his bride. He wants a relationship with you that is characterized by loving while simultaneously being loved. This is the truth about God. Have you ever heard some people say, I don't want to hear about that love stuff. I, I want to hear the truth. A lot of people have a lot of ideas of truth, but I want to suggest to you tonight that all truth brings you to Jesus, who is capital T truth. Jesus reveals to you the Father, and we've, dis we've discovered tonight that the truth about God is 1 John 4, 8. That that is what God is like. God is love. For the truth about God, for the truth about God is known to them instinctively. This is Paul talking in Romans, speaking about the Gentiles, those that don't necessarily have uh, uh, a, a access to the gospel message. He says, for they know them instinctively. God has put this knowledge into their hearts. It says also in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes that he has placed eternity in our hearts. There is an innate desire, an innate need. Some people call it a God-sized gap for us to reach out to God who is love. Truth about God is that God is love. The Bible goes on to say in 
John chapter 8, verse 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We're going to discover in a couple nights that this truth about God, that all truth, all doctrines found in Scripture are revealing something deeper about the person of God. And I want to tell you that that truth and its ultimate reality is God is love. It's how it began, and it's how our story will ultimately end. God is love. But I want to tell you the truth, that God wants to set us free tonight. You see, in the garden, we fell from that ideal. And it's through the truth about God that was revealed ultimately in Jesus Christ, and the greatest expression of God's truth is the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus wants to reconcile you back to the Father, Jesus says here that the truth shall make you free. He says, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Paul, again, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 12, he says, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and live the life of love. If God is love and we were made in the image of God, then what should we therefore be doing? Living the life of love. This is only possible through the power of the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead. And Jesus says that the Father will send him to you. He is available to us. As a matter of fact, the reason you're here is because the Holy Spirit brought you here. The Holy Spirit wants to so infill us that this becomes something that is natural in our experience. That's what God wants for you, to live the life of love. Now, some people may hear this and say, well, I got to go out now and I got to try harder to love people. Now, can we muster that in and of ourselves? No, friends. As a matter of fact, actually, this begins by what I call the see, think, feel, behave principle. See, think, feel, behave. What you see or how you see determines how you think. How you think determines how you feel. And how you feel determines how or influences greatly how you behave. You see, many times we want to fix people's behavior, but we're not dealing with the sequence. You see, some people have a picture in their minds about what they are like, maybe something that was spoken to them when they were a child, and many times they also have a picture of what God is like. And so therefore, based on what they are seeing, it influences how they are thinking in their brain, and then that affects how they're feeling emotionally, because we are holistic beings, and then that outcome is how they behave. And so if you want to begin to live that life of love, I want to encourage you tonight to begin as you read Scripture, to start seeing God for who He is. The Bible says we love God because He first loved us. You see, God was the initiator. And when God reveals to us that he is love, it then causes us to want to reflect that same thing back to him. Has someone ever done something good for you? What does it make you want to do back for them? It makes you want to do something good back to them. And it's an ebb and flow of continual loving while being loved. How you see determines how you think. How you think determines how you feel. How you feel will determine ultimately how you behave. This ultimately is the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives, producing the fruit of the Spirit. The first fruit of the Spirit, by the way, is love. Jesus wants you to believe the good news tonight. Friends, tonight as we close, the good news about God is that, number one, God loves you, and he has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to enter into human history, to stretch his arms wide, and to pay the penalty for your sins and my sins. We could not save ourselves, and I am telling you tonight that we still cannot save ourselves. The Bible says our righteousness is like filthy rags. We need Jesus Christ, the Lord, our righteousness. He promises to give us that righteousness if we will simply believe. You see, believing is seeing, and how we see influences how we think, and how we think influences how we feel, and how we feel influences how we 
behave. I want to challenge you. I want to encourage you. Believe the good news tonight and live the life of love. I want to invite you, if now, if you believe the word of God, to stand with me tonight as we ask God to help that be our commitment, to live the life of love through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want to also challenge you to share that good news with someone that God places in your sphere of influence. Let's pray. Jesus Christ, we thank you so much for coming to this planet to do primarily two things, to reveal to us what the Father is like, that God is love, that he so loved the world that he sent you, his only begotten son, into the world, that whosoever believeth in you should have eternal life. And then two, he came to die on the cross alone. And when he was thinking about going back to the Father and forgetting this mess of trying to redeem us, he said, I would rather go to the grave than leave one of these my children here without a hope of being reconciled to the Father. God, I thank you so much that Jesus Christ rose again that Sunday morning, giving us the hope of the ages, that we are, through Christ, redeemed and reconciled to you. Father, teach us, help us, show us, infill us through your Holy Spirit to live the life of love so that others will see him, see you, see Jesus in us, and be drawn to you by the life that we live, to give credibility to what you will inspire us to say to them that shares that you are love. Father, be with those that will be coming from night to night. I pray, Lord, that you will keep them safe as they leave here tonight. I pray that you'll touch each heart and keep us safe in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.